All right, we're back for part three of our unit on polymers, and we're going to continue looking at, oops, continue looking at the most common polymers. So the fourth most commonly produced polymer is abbreviated PETE, -E, uh, which is a type of polyester. Um, in chemistry, we talk about different functional groups. If you're in organic chemistry, you might recognize this sort of grouping here as being an ester linkage. And so this particular plastic with this repeating subunit, we would call a polyester. Annual production, three, 30 million metric tons in 2017. Around 60% of this is used for fabric. So most, uh, you know, like these exercise shirts that you see here that are made out of some material that's not cotton, those sort of stay dry fabrics are typically made out of polyester. 1970s, polyester was very uh, popular as a clothing material. Around 30% is used for making drink containers as well. And you can see this plastic bottle is made out of uh, polyester as well. The way these are actually made, you can see on the right are these little bottles here, and then they're heated and expanded to make whatever shape you want the bottle to be afterwards. These are recyclable under the recycling code number one. That was quick. On to plastic number five is polystyrene, PS. And this is one of the ones that's perhaps most vilified out of all of the plastics that we've talked about so far. Um, and the main reason for this is out of all of these plastics that we've talked about, polystyrene is probably the most stable in the environment. It has the longest lifetime. It has the slowest breakdown in the environment. So once it gets out into the environment, it's going to be there essentially unchanged for a long, 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 long time. It's made from this particular molecule called styrene, which is then linked together in long chains called polystyrene that you can see right here. So if the polystyrene plastic is uh, has air pumped into it as it's produced, it makes a foam, which we call styrofoam. And these cups like this, of course, made out of styrofoam, if there's no air in it, it makes a fairly dense plastic, but very kind of a cheap, easily breakable plastic. Think of like a yogurt container, like the individual yogurt containers you can get. Those are typically packaged in polystyrene. And uh, very, very cheap toys, polystyrene as well. So this is the number five plastic, annual production of around 15 million metric tons. And these are recyclable in some places with the recycling code number six. Another piece of art by Chris Jordan. Uh, this piece of art shows uh, 166,000 packing peanuts, which are usually made out of the styrofoam material as well. And this is, of course, typically a single use for this kind of material. Although you're starting to see some places move away from the polystyrene, the, the, the um, styrofoam packing peanuts and move towards um, cellulose-based ones or starch-based ones as well, which are biodegradable, which is nice. So this number, by the way, is equal to the number of overnight packages shipped in the air in the U.S. every hour. To zoom in so you can see actually how many of them there actually are. Uh, one thing, though, I wanted to talk about is you know, is styrofoam really that bad? And I just wanted to talk about uh, a very interesting paper that was published by actually a colleague of mine when I was at University of Victoria, who's a prof at University of Victoria. And what they were looking at was a number of materials uh, that we might typically use to store a hot drink, like a coffee. And styrofoam cups is, of course, one of these. These are typically single use. Same with a paper cut, like you would have from Tim Hortons. Uh, although these are paper, but they're lined with plastic on the inside. Uh, you'd have a glass mug, you could have a plastic mug, and I'm not sure what kind of plastic that is, uh, or a ceramic mug. And so what it's looking at is the amount of energy required to make each one of these things. And the amount of energy to make the styrofoam cup is far, far, far smaller than it would be for any of the others. So the this is how much energy is required to make each one per cup. And notice how it's very, very small for the foam compared to something like a typical ceramic reusable coffee mug. 
And what they do in this paper is they talk about from an energy perspective, uh, you know, if, if your main concern was using less and less energy, which would make sense from a maybe a global warming perspective, um, you would have to reuse the ceramic coffee mug uh, 14 times 5 times. So, you know, you're looking somewhere around 80 t reuses of a ceramic mug to equal the sort of embodied energy of that same number of, uh, of foam cups. Which actually, when you think about it, yeah, you probably use a ceramic mug 80 times, but that calculation actually assumes that you never wash it, you don't use hot water, and you don't use soap. And it works out that if you wash it in between uses, or maybe between every two or three uses, you actually never come out ahead by using the reusable cup. Uh, they go on to say in the paper that if you then took your re, uh, single use cup and you incinerated it and got the heat back out of it, uh, it's sort of like you're reusing the oil necessary to make it. So from that perspective, they were saying that from an energy standpoint, these styrofoam cups aren't that bad at all for the environment when you think of it this way. And that the problem with them is mainly more about the fact that they create a garbage problem if they get themselves out in the environment, uh, which is not a problem with the material, they argue, but a problem with our sort of garbage collection services, uh, not with the services themselves, but our ability to make sure we put them in the right place. All right, so we're out of our top five. There's a few other sort of niche ones that I wanted to talk about um, before we finish this up. The next one was Teflon. And uh, so you can see um, this monomer right here. It's the same as ethylene, except it has four fluorines on it. So it's tetrafluoroethylene. So polytetrafluoroethylene is the PTFE, is Teflon and it makes this structure that you can see right here. Teflon is extremely unreactive, which means inert. Nothing will react with it. And it's also very non-sticky, so neither oil nor water will adhere to it. Accidentally developed in 1938. I have a picture here of an iguana. And the reason I have that picture is because uh, iguanas, if you've ever gone down south, are very well known for climbing up walls and sticking to ceilings and things like that. Uh, Teflon was the first material discovered that was so unsticky that, um, did I say iguana? Geckos is what I meant to say. Geckos can't walk up uh, and stick to Teflon because it's too non-stick. Teflon is uh, often used to coat other materials to make them uh, maybe waterproof or stain proof. If you put it on a carpet, it's called Scotchgard. If you um, put it on fabrics, I think it's called Gore-Tex. You can put it on all sorts of different things. Another new and kind of emerging area over the last, say, 20 years is the invention of new polymers, which are called conductive polymers. And conductors, of course, are things that will transmit electricity uh, like copper is a great example, which is in wires. The idea would be if you could replace sort of heavy, bulky, expensive metals with something that's light, cheap, easily processed uh, plastic that could conduct electricity just as well as copper, uh, that would have enormous application. So people are investigating this. The first one was discovered way back in the 1970s. Uh, where if you take this particular compound, which is polyacetylene, acetylene has a structure that looks like this. So if you, this would be the monomer. If you polymerize that, you get this polyacetylene plastic, which you see here, repeated again and again and again, very long chains. And then if you dope this by treating it with iodine, it makes a plastic material that is just as conductive as copper. So this actually initiated a lot of research after this came out, and there's a lot of people looking at plastics and polymers that uh, can transmit electricity. The other thing too is you can modify these polymers very easily by changing out some of these groups with various other molecular parts. So you can tune them to really have the exact properties you want them to have uh, once you have sort of the main 
chemistry kind of figured out. These three guys got the Nobel Prize in the year 2000 for the discovery and development of conducting polymers, and it's only grown since that time. So you can buy some consumer products that has conducting polymers in it. In this particular case, these are uh, LG brand OLED TVs. OLED stands for organic light emitting diodes. Uh, these are plastics, they're polymers, which you can get to emit light when you put an electric current through them. Uh, the nice thing about these compared to sort of the, maybe the older technology, what's well, still quite current actually is a uh, liquid crystal displays. Uh, old TVs, the way they kind of worked is they would have a, you know, they'd have these sort of lights on the back, on the inside, which are LED lights. And then you have pixels, which you can think of as like little squares that would sort of, uh, you could open and close the windows, if you know what I mean. So you could let the light through or you could make the light stop. And that's how you'd see your TV screen if your eye was over here watching. The problem with these liquid crystal displays is if all of those windows are shut and the lights are still on in the back, uh, what happens is when you look at it, it still has a glow to it. So even if the screen is perfectly black, it has this sort of glow because some light is leaking through. Um, with an OLED, what you have instead is just a pixel where you put, you put a, a voltage across the pixel and it will either light up or not light up depending on what the voltage is. So that way when the light's off, when it's black, it's perfectly black. And so you see these TVs are uh, advertised as being perfect black because when the background is black, it's actually off. There's no light coming out. These OLEDs are what you find in the iPhones. I guess it's just iPhone 11 Pros. And the nice thing is you get really high contrast because the blacks are very dark and the colors are quite bright. And they also use less energy because the light's not always on like they are with the LEDs. They're always on in the back. I think the regular iPhone 11 is just a regular liquid crystal display. It doesn't have the OLED. So you're seeing these become more and more popular. All right. So yeah, this is just some more information that you can take a look if you want. But OLEDs are probably going to be what's going to be the next generation of displays and TVs. Uh, another thing about the OLEDs is because they're made out of plastic, you can actually make them much more flexible than you can uh, liquid crystal displays. So there's talk about making displays like TVs that you could maybe roll up or do something like that with. Another area where there's a lot of research going on is making bioplastics. And this is replacing sort of the traditional plastic that are all made out of um, basically hydrocarbons that come from crude oil. That's true for polyethylene and polypropylene. Uh, and replacing them with biological materials like cornstarch uh, to produce a plastic that is, first of all, maybe renewable, made from a renewable resource, and also ones that are biodegradable. And so you can see these quite a bit too. They're currently much more expensive. Uh, there's a much lower range, I would say, of properties that you can put in them. But you're starting to see you can find products that use this sort of uh, bioplastic in, in packaging. So these are a couple of different variations that you can see. This picture here was taken at uh, Acadia, at one of those little coffee kiosks. So you can buy uh, this corn plastic. And this is perhaps the most common one. It's called plastarch material. It's made from corn starch and potentially other types of starch as well. Sometimes it's just called corn plastic. And I guess the idea is it's biodegradable. So if you took this and you threw it out in the woods and it got kind of half buried by, you know, <laughs> leaves or whatever, it would decompose and uh, disappear after a period of time. Um, the bioplastics aren't perfect. They're not a cure-all as well. Um, there's a few environmental issues. They only reduce fossil fuel use by about 20 to 40 percent. And that's because you still need to use a lot of energy to process them. You need to use energy to grow the starch in the first place. Uh, when they decompose, they release greenhouse gas, mainly 
CO2 if there's lots of oxygen around when they decompose, or CH4 if it's if they decompose anaero anaerobically. So regular plastics, I mean, I guess they do hang around a long period of time, but at least if you landfill them and bury them in a in a good way, they don't over their lifetime then continue to release greenhouse gas into the environment. Um, land is needed to grow the corn in the first place. So either we use our corn we're using for food or feed to make this plastic, or we cut down more forests to grow more. And of course, if there's competition for the use of corn in this way, uh, it'll increase in value as a commodity, which will increase food prices as well. So, you know, bioplastics solve some problems, but arguably they create some other ones as well. That's it for us for this chapter. So we've broken it up into three sections. You will find um, after you complete these, you can go on to Top Hat and we have a couple of Top Hat questions posted based on this unit. And that's it.